to express my thanks to uh, IGS and its many supporters and uh, hard-working staff for holding this event. Uh, and I am Max Simon, uh, you're not. And I've been a University of California citizen for a long time, uh, toiling in the provinces uh, in Southern California, inland Southern California, but from 2005 to 10, I had the pleasure of coming to Rome and working at the uh, Public Policy Institute of, in, of California in, in a city otherwise known as San Francisco. And I've been privileged then, um, since then to uh, be at IGS. I also want to thank the journalists who cover state politics uh, in the various formats that comprise contemporary journalism. Uh, the work they produce is exceptionally valuable and informative, and I earnestly hope they are heard and read by an ever-widening audience. So that's our morning prayer. Uh, this morning, uh, we ask whether campaigns matter in a state so completely dominated by the Democratic Party. It's a theme that was laced uh, throughout the conversations yesterday afternoon. Uh, when considering, for example, when, whether Meg Whitman or other GOP candidates for statewide office could have done anything to win. Even as we discuss the host of specific campaign resources, tactics, campaign decisions, candidate qualities, there were references, particularly when the polling results were discussed, to uh, some of the underlying fundamentals in the state. In a variety of ways, we touched on such enduring and shaping factors as the state's demography, the tension between primary and general election contests, the interplay between immigration and GOP doctrine, the depleted and pathetic state of public trust in civic institutions and public servants, and the arguable impact of public employee unions. In a year when frustration with the economy and general disquiet with the Obama administration in the rest of the nation seemed to produce a historic tide of GOP success, California leaves much of the rest of the country asking, what's wrong with California? Well, before turning to our audience, let me introduce some people who will hopefully stimulate a constructive conversation about these matters and help us to answer that question. And um, in the order of their talks, I'll start with Thad Kauser, a political science professor at UC San Diego. Thad is one of those people who brings a mix of high-minded civicness, civic um, virtue and commitment to political reform and rigorous scholarship to the study of state politics and policy in general. He's the co-editor of a leading academic journal on state politics and public policy and he's observed and participated the work of legislative staff at the state and national levels. He's a nationally recognized expert on term limits and also a co-editor of the new Political Geography of California in NIGS publication. Some of his many involvements and accomplishments are summarized in the program, but I want to emphasize his mix of scholarship and personal and practical involvement in the world of policymaking politics, which is a feature that all of our um, speakers today have. Uh, next, Ken Miller. Uh, professor of Government at Claremont McKenna College. He comes to us with a background as a Harvard-educated lawyer who, after a number of years in practice, uh, decided to earn his doctorate in political science at UC Berkeley. He's the author of a fascinating book on direct, direct democracy in the courts, which of course addresses two major arenas of public dissatisfaction with conventional avenues of legislative and gubernatorial policymaking. He's also a co-author of the IGS publication, Political Geography, The New Political Geography of California. Ken is aware of how population shifts and demographic sorting contribute to the state's political fundamentals. And his career, moreover, will help us grapple with some of the legal and institutional fundamentals that shape California's election. He is an associate director of the Rose Institute of State and Local Government at California, uh, excuse me, Claremont McKenna College. Kim Nolder. To my right over here is a professor of government at California State University at Sacramento. She's focused on the fundamentals of voting behavior and public opinion. She has examined the impact of term limits and public perceptions regarding Proposition 13 and also brings a mix of political practice to her work, having worked with news organizations and advocacy groups. She has written a very interesting and provocative article recently concerning how misperceptions about Proposition 13 seem to be lodged unexpectedly among the most informed segment of the electorate. I guess they're not informed about Proposition 13, though. 
Uh, Kim is a founder of the Media Research Lab at California State University, Sacramento's Institute for Social Research, and the uh, work there focuses, uh, she has a project there evidently monitoring television news coverage. Finally, we're privileged to have Tony Quinn to my immediate right here, a co-editor of the California Target book. It's hard to imagine someone more experienced in as many venues of political action. He's an accomplished scholar, perhaps most notable in the arena of redistricting. He's a respected consultant. He has managed legislative and executive branch entities. He clearly understands California from a comparative perspective and has an ecumenical perspective regarding the role of partisanship in civic life. His expertise is in political demography reflected in his highly regarded book, uh, which anyone interested in redistricting has to master, which is called Carving Up California. And he'll help us understand as well some of the underlying factors shaping the political fortunes of the two major parties in California. So without further ado, uh, we can start uh, with Tad. To, to be part of the IGS Governors Conference. I, I've been coming to these since, since 1998, and they're one of my favorite conferences, because not least because it gives us academics the chance to climb out of our ivory towers, at least for a day, but also because we get the chance to hear from political consultants who are, who are thoughtful people who don't get a lot of time for reflection during the, the rough and tumble of a campaign. And, and, and this venue gives them the chance to, to sit back, digest a campaign, and, and, and ponder a question like the question posed for our panel. Do campaigns matter? Which for them is sort of an existential question. Do, do campaign consultants matter? And, and, and I think that the answer that they give at, at this conference every four years is, is probably a little different than the one they give in the course of a campaign. So I imagine what they're saying at the beginning of a campaign, uh, implicitly or explicitly to a candidate is, look, hire us, spend $180 million on our ads, and there's no way you can lose. And then, at the end of a campaign, everyone except for the team who is fortunate to win comes back and sits on this podium and says, look, with the fundamentals of the race and what was going on with partisan trends, and, and there was just no way we could have won. Right? So there, there's a little bit of a switch. And, and, and that leads to this uh, idea, you know, after this, in the wake of this amazing 2010 election, one of the things that we've heard over and over again about California politics is that we become an island, a political island unto ourselves. This, this is an actual map. This is the, 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 the cartographical mistake that actually gave our state its names, the early explorers. They, they came up the Sea of Cortez. They thought it was an island. They named it after California, this mythical island of the Amazons. And, and sort of in, in our history, we've, we've been rediscovering uh, ever since all the different ways that we're an island, all the different ways that the, the normal laws of society and politics don't apply to us, that they stop on our shores. And to be sure, in this election, they stopped on our shores. So, so everywhere else, right, in the country in this election, Republicans were, were partying like it was 1994. We saw that. But in California, it was 2008 all over again. It was a democratic landslide. And, and, and that has led to this idea that we are, we are an invariably blue state, right? That, the, that we've seen many obituaries of the Republican Party in, in, in the press and, and, and a bit at this conference in, in a way that, you know, I haven't seen so many obituaries declaring the Republican Party dead since Obama's landslide victory at the national level when we were sure that Republicans would, would never take any place again. And, and so what I want to make is, is to sort of first make a quick point that, that we're all aware of, right? Which is that can Republicans ever win a governor's race again? Look, of course we can. In nine, four years ago, four years ago, we, we were at this conference hearing that there was no way that Phil Angeles ever could have won this election, right? That, that, and we heard that there were, you know, in fact, 722,766 reasons why Republicans still matter in campaigns. That's how many more votes Arnold Schwarzenegger got in 2006 than Meg Whitman got in 2010. And so, uh, looking at these, at, at these campaigns, uh, I, I drew on uh, the field poll data here, although I respect every California poll, whether human or robotic, and hope they'll share their data with me. Uh, so, so look, let, you've all seen this sort of the, the, the dynamics of this campaign. This, this campaign was, was a dead heat with Meg Whitman actually, you know, in, in reddish having a lead in the early parts of this campaign, things staying even all the way through the summer, and then 
As a result, I, you know, I think primarily of, 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 of a scandal that, that hurt Meg Whitman on, on both sides of the political aisle. Uh, we, we, we saw Jerry Brown go, go out to a double-digit lead. But, but did anybody really think at any point in this campaign that it was inevitable that Republicans would never ever be competitive at the, at the statewide level in California? I, I didn't hear a lot of that uh, being said until, until this lead opened up. And you might think that, well, look, you know, campaigns sort of move around a bit, but, but, but Arnold Schwarzenegger was always going to win and Meg Whitman was always going to lose. But, but if you look at sort of the, the tracking numbers in, in Arnold Schwarzenegger's campaign, he started out tied with Phil Angelides, the beginning of this campaign. He started to open up a little bit of a lead before the primaries, and then it was really during a, a summer in which he went heavily on the air and a fall in which he embraced uh, uh, this landmark global climate change initiative and, 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 and sort of solidified his lead, that was when he opened up his campaign. So it was not inevitable that Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to win, and it was not inevitable that, that Meg Whitman was going to lose, if, if you believe any of this data. And I think this fits, though, with you know, the, the things we think we know in, or are pretty sure we know in political science about campaigns. So here's what we're pretty sure we know. First thing is that campaign effects are marginal. You know, most elections are pretty predictable, even though they have some variation. They're marginal, but marginal effects really count in close races. You know, ju just ask President Al Gore, right? So it's marginal effects matter. The, the second thing that we know uh, about campaigns is that, um, well, in political science lingo, the, the political communication of campaigns uh, activates voters' underlying preferences. And in English, what this means is that campaigns remind voters who they are. And they remind voters who, can, who candidates are. So what we often see, if you disaggregate these polling figures into, into what, different, what Democrats, Republicans, and, you know, so Republicans, independents and Democrats, who they favor over the course of the campaign, what you often see is this, this reverse funneling effect, where at the beginning of a campaign, it's easy, you know, Democrats can flirt with Meg Whitman, Republicans can, uh, can think, oh, this Jerry Brown guy, he might be our guy, and then over the course of a campaign, you know, uh, good campaigns will move their base solidly into their, into their camp. The, uh, the opposition, if they're running a good campaign, moves their base solidly into their camp, and, and they're really fighting over the middle. Right, and what we saw in Arnold Schwarzenegger's sort of two successful runs is at the beginning of the day, a lot of crossover support, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger closing the deal with Republicans and convincing those, those moderates to get on, on board with him by, by reminding voters of, of who he was and, and, and who they were and why they liked him. Well, what happened with Meg Whitman? Okay, well, let's look at Democrats. At the beginning of the day, you know, one in five Democrats were flirting with Meg Whitman at the beginning of this campaign. She was a new kind of Republican. She didn't even use the word Republican in, in her Super Bowl ads. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, her, her, her support among Democrats was only single digit. Uh, so, so the Democratic campaign brought their folks home. Well, let's look at Republicans. So at the beginning of the day, Meg Whitman had about 76% support among Republicans. She starts to bring them home early in the campaign. But by the time the campaign really gets going in September and October, she never closes a deal. She's stuck with only three quarters of Republicans supporting her. So, so one thing that this campaign didn't do was bring home the base in a way that, that successful campaigns do, in, in a way that Arnold Schwarzenegger's campaign, in a way that, you know, that, that Pete Wilson and George Duke Majin did. Let's, let's not forget that until this election, Republicans had won six out of the last eight gubernatorial races in California. We were not considered an impenetrably blue state. Uh, so, so what happened with moderates, the, the surprising thing in this campaign is because she didn't bring home uh, she didn't bring home Republicans, but she also didn't bring home moderates. Uh, so, so she lost on both sides. And I think that was in part because she had a scandal, you know, with, with, with the Nikki Gates scandal that, that, that both hurt her on the left and on the right, that led to Latinos not being happy with her stand, you know, reminding, reminded of her stand on immigration, but also the John and Ken show the next morning saying don't vote for her because she employed an illegal immigrant. And so, you know, she, she lost on both sides because of that scandal. And that was, that was a problem with her campaign uh, that wasn't malpracticed by her consultants, but that was sort of just, a, you know, a, a tough road for, for her to overcome. So what's the, the third thing that we know about campaigns from the political science literature? And that's that, that campaigns can't tell people what to think, but they can tell them what to think about. 
So, so they can tell them who to think about, so they can remind them who voters think is the least popular person. And, and really the two signature ads, these two campaigns, were ones that, cam that, that compared the losing candidate with California's current political villain. So in 2006, it was those ads in the summer with Phil Angelides walking backwards to the Gray Davis era that really worked for Arnold Schwarzenegger. In 2010, it was Jerry Brown's ads that showed the mirror images and the, and the, and, and the echoing statements of Meg Whitman and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. So it sort of reminded these effective campaigns, reminded voters who they were mad at. And, and also these, the issues that these campaigns came to focus on, immigration in the Meg Whitman campaign and the environment in Arnold Schwarzenegger's victory were ones that through, through a scandal or through Arnold Schwarzenegger's embrace of, of AB 32 in, 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 on Labor Day in 2006. These are things where, where candidates were able to remind voters you know, what they, where they stood. And then finally, I wanted to map these, these, the, the results and see where Meg Whitman did much worse than Arnold Schwarzenegger. So she loses, she, she loses about 15 points across the state. But in the map I'm going to show you, the lighter areas are the areas where she only lost about 10 to 12 points, where she did pretty well, and the dark areas are the ones where she really got killed. What I expected to see if the conventional wisdom was that you know, she lost by, by turning too far right in the, in the primary, I'd expect to see uh, the mountains, the Republican heartland in the east part of the state being really light, her doing really well there, and then darkness all up and down the coast. I also expect to see lightness in the Silicon Valley, her base, and darkness in Arnold Schwarzenegger's base, uh, the, which is LA. Instead, what we see is amazingly, she ran really well in Southern California, LA, Orange County, and, and Ventura. She ran really well. She ran relatively poorly in the Republican heartland of, of, of the valley. Uh, so, so again, this emphasizes that she didn't bring home her base. And most shockingly, she did pretty terribly in Silicon Valley. She really didn't bring home her base in the Silicon Valley and ran sort of relative to Schwarzenegger better in LA than in the Silicon Valley. So there were a lot of sort of surprising complexities that I think show us that, that nothing was inevitable in this campaign and it had a lot to do with the way that both campaign teams managed their, managed their candidates. Thanks. So I, I thought I'd look at this question as to whether California can be a competitive state for Republicans in uh, 2010 and looking forward by comparing the 2010 election with the last national Republican wave election in 1994. And so looking back to 94, um, California participated in what was one of the, um, the biggest Republican victories in the last uh, half century. Um, it was, the wave was uh, virtually as strong in California as it was nationally. Um, looking below just the, the top of the ticket, Republicans picked up three House seats in 1994, two seats in the state Senate. Um, Republicans won eight assembly seats to gain a fleeting majority in the, uh, the state assembly. Uh, not only that, Republicans won five statewide offices in 1994, uh, Pete Wilson, one for governor. Uh, he won by 15 points over Kathleen Brown, 55 to 40 percent. Um, Dan Lundgren did almost identically as well. He won by 14 points over Tom Unberg statewide. Uh, Matt Fong won for treasurer. Bill Jones, secretary of state, and Chuck Quackenbush, Republican, won for insurance commissioner. Uh, even in the U.S. Senate race, popular U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein nearly lost her seat in '94 to. Michael Huffington, she won by less than two points over Huffington. So California in 1994, that's sort of the high water mark for Republican success in both statewide and legislative offices in the last um, couple of generations. 2010, again, was nationally a Republican wave year, but as everybody knows, it had no effect in California in terms of the, the, the races here. And I just want to highlight the dimension of the Republican loss in California in 2010. Uh, Meg Whitman lost by nearly 13 points. Um, Carly Fiorina, this was supposed to be one of these toss-up races. She lost by 10 points to Barbara Boxer on election day. Um, in the other statewide races, the margin of victory for Gavin Newsom was 11 points. For Dave Jones, for insurance commissioner, was 13 points. Deborah Bowen won by 15, John Chong by 19, and Bill Lockyer by 20 points. So these were not close races. These were large victories by Democrats in an overwhelmingly Republican year nationally. 
In terms of legislative races, Republicans didn't pick up any seats in uh, the state assembly, the state um, senate, or in congressional races. There were supposedly going to be some close uh, congressional races where Republicans could pick up a couple of seats in the Central Valley. It turned out not to be the case. So uh, 1994 looks very different than 2010. The state is different. Um, I think you can trace the difference to very shortly after 1994. The 1998 uh, state election um, was a big drop off. Lundgren was defeated in a landslide by Gray Davis. Um, there were a couple of Republicans who won statewide office uh, in 98, but by 2002, that was a shutout. Democrats won all the statewide uh, races in 2002. And in fact, if you looked over the last decade, only two Republicans have won statewide races in California. If you count U.S. Senate, governors, uh, the other statewide races, Arnold Schwarzenegger in the recall and in his 2006 reelection, and Steve Poisner over Cruz Bustamante for insurance commissioner. All other races have gone to the Democrats, statewide races. Uh, and so I think you have to look in, in, at the Schwarzenegger races, which um, Thad has highlighted, and say really they're an anomaly. That Schwarzenegger won in the recall in exceptional circumstances and then ran a very smart re-election campaign that we heard about four years ago, where he positioned himself in the center. He brought home his base, but he reached out on environmental issues in, in other ways, um, took immigration off the table, <coughs> Um, in a lot of ways, really positioned himself ideally for the California electorate, and he was successful in 2006. Poisoner had a, a weak opponent against uh, Bustamante in 2006, but otherwise, uh, Democrats win when, um, regularly and win large, often by large margins. So um, I think it's, it's really hard to say that Republicans can expect by running sort of marginally better campaigns to be consistently competitive in California state elections. I think it is possible for Republicans sometimes to win under some circumstances. In 2010, there was a real chance that Steve Cooley could have won the attorney general's race. Um, he lost by less than 1% to uh, Attorney General Harris. And, but I think if you, if you think about it, this was uh, uh, a prosecutor who had won election in LA County multiple times. Uh, Kamala Harris was perceived, and I think probably is, to be left of the median voter on criminal justice issues in California. There was certainly an opportunity for Republicans to pick up that one race in California at least, but even there, um, the, the Democrats won uh, the Attorney General's race. So California has significantly changed over the past uh, decade and a half, and I, um, as we if we, if we looked at this in our new political geography book, we, we think that really the most important, significant sort of geographic change in the state has occurred in L.A. County. Uh, Los Angeles County, as of 1990, was basically a 50-50 proposition. You, uh, the congressional delegation was evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats in 1980, and Republican statewide candidates would often basically break even in L.A. County. That was the, the, the task for Republicans to win statewide, was to win the interior of the state down through San Diego and Orange County and then break even in L.A. County, and that would give you um, a statewide sort of uh, coalition that you needed to win. And in fact, that's the way Pete Wilson won in 1994. He won Los Angeles County by four points in that governor's race in 1994. Um, but over the course of the last uh, decade and a half, L.A. County has just changed significantly for a number of reasons. The exodus of the more conservative white population, either by death or by departure to other parts of the state or out of state. Um, the growth of the Latino community, um, which is increasingly incorporated into politics, voting and voting heavily Democratic in L.A. County, and some other factors. But Los Angeles County is now nearly as Democratic as the Bay Area. Not quite, but close. And that's just a huge change in, in the state politics. So just looking at a few numbers, um, Jerry Brown beat Meg Whitman in Los Angeles County, 62% to 31%, a 31% margin. And again, remember Pete Wilson won in LA County by 4% over Kathleen Brown in um, 1994. 
And the Cooley-Harris um, race is very interesting to look at as well. Cooley, who's won election um, as district attorney in Los Angeles on multiple occasions, we expected LA County to be, um, he'd be very competitive there and that would be part of his um, path to victory. But in fact, um, Harris beat Cooley in Los Angeles County 53% to 39% um, by 14 points. So um, the, the terrain for Republicans is just incredibly difficult. Uh, there are reasons for that, which we'll, we've talked about yesterday and we'll talk about more probably in this panel and, and elsewhere. Um, individual candidates, I think, can occasionally win elections in California statewide, but that's going to be the rare exception, unless and until uh, the California Republican Party can appeal more broadly to the California electorate, which is a changing electorate based on the changing demographics of the state. The Republican Party needs to expand and grow its um, appeal and embrace uh, the state's immigrants and minority groups in places like Los Angeles County, suburban Los Angeles, the Central Valley, and other places where um, the, the party needs to be competitive in, uh, in order to win statewide. Uh, and I, I do think that, it's, um, as Thad says, this, this isn't set in stone. There are, uh, it's, you shouldn't write an obituary for all time for a party. There are ways in which the Republicans could recover. The one thing I see is a point of vulnerability for the Democrats in California is uh, the fiscal management of a state that is on the brink of insolvency. And so if Democrats somehow get blamed for the fiscal problems that still lie ahead, um, the Republicans could capitalize on, on that. But uh, that's only part of the picture. Republicans have to be able to appeal more broadly to the electorate, including and especially the state's growing minority population. Thank you. Okay, so on the question of, you know, does the, demo, the, the registration advantage of Democrats give the Republicans an insurmountable uh, task in trying to win elections statewide? If we look at the 2010 results for the statewide offices, it might look like that's the case, right? So the Democrats across the board got 50% or more, except for the, in the AG's race, and the Republicans ended up with anywhere between 36% and 42%. So when you look at numbers like that, it looks as if, you know, maybe it's all over for the Republican Party, but it's not insurmountable. They're not doomed entirely. There are several reasons that that's the case. Um, one of the reasons is that Republicans tend to overperform their registration numbers more than the Democrats do. So this is just the last few Republican races, and this is versus their own party registration. So we're looking at the, the relative to their own party registration. Now, when you look at 2006, there are actually more Democratic registrants than there are Angelides voters, right? So he's actually underperforming in that case. Um, but, but in every case, you, even the Whitman example, you see her overperforming registration. Now this is mostly because you have higher turnout rates among Republicans, and that continues to be the case, right? So that turnout advantage is an advantage, but then you see you know, the phenomenon like with Schwarzenegger, where he's pulling from the independents, He's pulling from his own party pretty well, but he's also getting some, some votes across the aisle, as you see from that negative number for the Angelides camp. Um, another uh, thing that could benefit them is that the, the independents can break either way. So this is from PPIC, and you see that uh, the Schwarzenegger example, and this is just independent voters, right? So uh, Schwarzenegger ends up with 54% of the independent vote, and then it flips over in 2008, and Obama at the top of the ticket ends up with a majority of those independent voters. So those decline to state independent voters can really go either way. They are winnable. There, it's it's a, a class that can be captured. And the numbers are increasing. The numbers of those decline to state voters have been increasing over time. Uh, however, in recent years, this doesn't look good for the Republicans. Uh, it seems that those numbers are coming from the Republican ranks more than from the Democratic ranks, right? So that, that spells possibly some, some doom for them. Uh, another issue is demographics. So we see um, Latino population increasing statewide, but also as a proportion of the electorate. And the same is true of Asian voters, that they're increasing as a proportion of the electorate over time, and that trend will continue as far as we can tell. 
Um, Latinos tend to identify as, as Democrats overwhelmingly. And in this last election, they voted Democratic even more overwhelmingly. So their, their numbers from an operation called Latino Decisions that, that polls extensively uh, in the, the Latino area. And they found uh, when they pooled leaners and identifiers, 74 percent uh, Democratic versus 17 percent Republican. Uh, in 2010, so that's really overwhelming, um, and it was actually magnified in the election results at the top of the ticket in the the, the um, in the governor's race. We actually saw the numbers even even worse for that for the Republicans, and that's no that's no accident, right? That happens because the Latinos are feeling alienated by policy and by campaign uh, ideas that are coming across. Um, so we, you know, if it goes back to Prop 187, uh, the driver's license issue, uh, Prop 209 even, uh, support for the Arizona law that sort of went back and forth in this campaign, amnesty, the DREAM Act. So there are all sorts of policies that, that send a message to Latino voters that they are not welcome, that, that the Republican Party is not the place for them. So the, the, the future seems to be trending away from the Republicans in that sense. They also do poorly among women. Um, women are more of the electorate than men. We tend to live longer. Sorry, guys. Um, and the party registration numbers are really lopsided. So you have a 16% um, differential between Republicans and Democrats on, among women. So women are 16% more likely to register as Democrats than Republicans. Among men, it's only a 4% differential. So when we're talking about this Democratic registration advantage in California, it's really among women. Primarily, it's not as much among the men. We're talking about female voters who are uh, identifying more with the Democratic Party. Um, and we actually saw in the, the Whitman-Brown campaign that Whitman did even worse than you would expect based on those registration numbers among women, about a 20% margin there. And so that's another area in which they're not doing so well. Uh, it seems to be the case, if you look at the Whitman campaign, that they had the impression that the way to win Latino votes was to speak to them in Spanish, and the way to win over women was to have a female candidate, and that was sufficient. Uh, you can almost imagine Republican campaign uh, consultants in a future campaign saying, you know, the way we need to do it is, you know, let's recruit, recruit a, a Latina. It doesn't matter what Latina, let's pick a famous one. Maybe we get Jennifer Lopez. We send her, spend her a, a lot of money to recruit her and get her to come move to California and run as a Republican. And it'll work great because she's a woman and she can do ads in Spanish. And so it's a done deal, right? It doesn't matter what the substance of the ad is. In fact, they, could, they probably would think that they could run ads that, um, would repeal, you know, suggested the repeal of the 19th Amendment and the deportation of everybody whose name ended with EZ, as long as, as you had, uh, you know, a woman at the top of the ticket. Um, sorry. Uh, another issue is the, the disconnect and that favors Republicans, potentially, but this is problematic because it's really about um, misinformation uh, and misunderstanding is the disconnect between taxes and services in, in a lot of voters' minds, right? That they want lower taxes and poll after poll, people want their taxes lower, but they also don't want the services that they like cut, right? And they want, in fact, increases in some of the, their favorite services that impact them personally. And so you see this disconnect between those two things as if there's no relationship between taxes and services. Uh, and I think the way they bridge that, that gap mentally is, um, oh, excuse me, um, is by explaining it through um, that, 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 that there's this idea that there's a lot of waste and inefficiency, right? So we, it makes sense then, if you believe that, that we can go ahead and cut taxes enormously um, because really it won't affect services because they, there's just a lot of waste there. So these are some numbers from field um, from May 08 and October 09, and the question was essentially, can the state provide about the same level of services, even if it cuts? In the first uh, poll, it was um, 14 to 20 billion, and then we upped it in, in October 2009 on that poll to 20 to 25 billion dollars. Right, so enormous. As the budget got worse and worse, the numbers went up. So enormous numbers. Uh, that could be cut from the budget, apparently, in people's minds without any uh, effect on services, right? So if you're in this mindset, 
um, you're fine with the pledges to not increase taxes under any circumstances. And, and the cuts seem to be possible without any, any sort of pain. Um, that favors Republicans, right? So as, uh, to the extent that people believe this and continue to believe this, the, the no taxes pledges seem reasonable. And so that's sort of the challenge that Brown will be facing because he's asking people to believe that there can't be as many cuts in service or as many cuts in taxes uh, as, as they're hoping that the money isn't there to make those ta ca tax cuts and in fact they should uh, approve some additional um, extensions of those taxes. So can Republicans win in California? They can but they need a third way. Uh, we saw Arnold being very successful and he called it post-partisanship but maybe something along those lines. Um, what would it be necessary though is to abandon those sort of absolutist, my way or the highway kinds of promises. Those play really well with you know, your Central Valley Republicans, the Tea Party types of people, but they don't play well with your swing voters, your declined estates, with women. Those sorts of claims and pledges are not, not um, amenable. Uh, another thing is having good relationships with reporters during the campaign, <laughs> right? Um, if you're standoffish with the reporters and evasive, they notice, right? And uh, we saw that real differential in, in the Whitman versus Brown campaign where he was probably too, too accessible sometimes uh, and willing to talk endlessly and, and she was walled off from the reporters and, and that's got to come out in the coverage, right? Uh, another thing is showing contempt for the process and, and for government might backfire in campaigns, especially when, you, when really what you need to do is target those sort of independent voters, women, Latinos, etc. You, you start to sort of scratch your head and wonder, well, why are you running to run this government if you have contempt for it, in fact, haven't voted in the last you know, several decades? Uh, you know, it's sort of like if we're applying business model to government, if you were applying to be a CEO of a corporation, you probably wouldn't do well if you bashed the corporation during the interview, right? Um, so that, that contempt doesn't draw, the, it draws some voters certainly, but it doesn't draw those voters in the middle that need to be persuaded. And then another thing is recognizing that the anti-tax and anti-government sentiment um, is tied up still with the pro-services conception. And so if we do see additional draconian cuts to services and it starts to become apparent to people that, that this is not true, uh, then it will be very challenging to um, continue to, to press for just the tax cuts. And that, that may be difficult for Republicans going into the future. And I think that the reason that California bucked the national trend, or one of the reasons that we bucked the national trend, is that we tried the throw the bums out thing um, we, we started it in 1990 with, with term limits and, and then we followed through with the, the recall of Gray Davis and it didn't, it didn't work, right? We discovered that, that we still have all these problems and so you know, we turned instead to sort of a, an old hand in government. Um, and that, that may not bode well for, for Republicans if Jerry Brown is successful, but if not, they may have uh, an in. Thank you. what I think I'll try to cover. Is this mic on? Yeah. Okay. I'll try to cover a, 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 the question, can the Republicans come back and how might they? Uh, start with a little bit of uh, history as to why, at least in California, absolutes might not uh, exactly work out that way. In 1964, the Republicans took a terrible beating. They were in worse shape then than they are now. In 1966, what was their response? It was to run for governor of this great state, a totally un, uh, a boom, a B movie actor that had never held public office in his life. The Democrats thought that was so good that they helped him. Uh, in the early part of the campaign, and then Ronald Reagan beat Pat Brown by a million votes, and Republicans won every state office but uh, one. Then there is the horrible state of the Republican Party after Watergate. And what should show up but this old coot by the name of Howard Jarvis? 
and he completely remade California politics to the extent that he played a major role in Ronald Reagan becoming president and 16 years of Republican governors after the first run with uh, uh, Jer uh, Jerry Brown. One thing that is of interest to me about the 2010 election, I think it has not been focused on, is how the voters voted on the ballot measures. In fact, they voted with the Republicans. Uh, it seemed the message from the voters was, we don't like you, and they certainly didn't like them. They didn't like Meg and the rest of them by the end, but we agree on a lot of stuff. And you take a look at the vote, for instance, did they vote to increase the car tax to save the parks? No, they voted against that. They even voted, the business community had given up on trying to convince the voters to uh, call fees taxes, Prop 26. The voters said, fine, we're willing to do, uh, do that. So there is a model, it seems to me, for the Republicans to come back. And the state to look at to find that model is uh, Chris Christie, the New Jersey gov governor. Take a look at New Jersey. Very blue state, at least as blue as uh, Cal uh, California is. High tax state. A view of the voters that the state's being run by a bloated bureaucracy controlled by public employee labor unions. That's what Christie ran against. No immigrant bashing, no social issues. Strictly staying on the uh, fiscal stuff. He got elected and he has had some uh, su uh, success. He certainly has picked plenty of fights. But if a Republican is going to come back, it seems to me that is going to be the kind of model. There's another place to look at, to look at uh, the, the, the uh, differences, and that is comparing California with the state of te Texas. Now, most Californians don't like Texas. We found that out in the Prop 23 uh, uh, campaign. But in fact, people from California are moving there. It looks like you can make the argument that Texas, a low tax state where the Republicans did tremendously well in 2010, they actually have control, uh, 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 two thirds control of both houses there and the Democrats have not elected a statewide office holder in Texas in, Texas in uh, 20 years. What are we finding when we look at Texas? Uh, the Economist magazine notes that 20% of the jobs growth in 2010 took place there. Uh, time has its jobs uh, recover recovery. Texas will be the number one state for jobs uh, recovery in 2012, 4.7%. We looked at the uh, reapportionment re between the states of congressional seats. Texas picked up four because people are moving there. And the kind of people that are moving there are the people that once made this the great economic giant. So I think the Republicans are going to be able to make an, an argument that should we go with let's raise taxes, which they don't want to do, or should we go, should we go with, with, with trying to uh, uh, incre increase growth? Uh, and trying to grow our way out of the budget problems. Texas has a serious budget problem also. They are, however, not going to raise taxes there. They are going to have some severe, severe cuts, more severe than we have, we have here. I think there are also enough of these anecdotal things uh, floating around, and I would just, just like to close with a couple of them which I think the Republicans could use to say this state as a one-party state is too greatly controlled by uh, the public sector unions. Uh, you have the Gilded 36. I don't know whether all of you know who they are. They are uh, 36, $500,000 plus employees of the University of California. Uh, they are these high-level bureaucrats and managers. The regions decided that when these people retire, they should only get $180,000 in pension. They're now going to sue because they think that they should get $300,000 in pensions. Well, you know, when you bring that to the public and then you say, why should we tax ourselves? Seems to me that that Republican argument, when it's, when it's phrased in, in, in human terms, starts to make effect. And finally, one of my favorite cases in uh, the Capitol, the lobbyist for the California School Boards uh, so Association, 
was making only $300,000. He decided that was not enough. So the school boards association, which is funded by the taxpayers through their school boards, raised his salary to $500,000. As a matter of fact, $570,000 still wasn't enough because the local uh, Sacramento television station noted that he was putting his gambling debts on the school board uh, credit card. So he is now retired. We have no idea what his pension is. I'll bet it's close to, to, close to $300,000. Those kind of cases, it seems to me, are going to be things that Republicans can use if they can somehow get away from all the problems that we saw in uh, 2010. I really think that the coming political division in California is going to be between working Californians and the public uh, sector that the working Californians think are not paying any sacrifice in these hard times. One of the reasons why the Republicans did so bad here is because working Californians tend to be younger, non-white, especially uh, Latino, Latinos. You know, uh, in my own family, uh, I wondered when I was a little kid why all my Irish relatives were still voting for the Democrats because they were making some money. And as you know, what is a Republican but a Democrat who's made some money? Uh, and uh, I'd ask them and say, well, you know, gosh, why should we vote with them? They don't like us. Well, as long as the Republicans give out to the real workers in California, the attitude, they don't like them, they're not going to get their uh, votes. But it does seem to me that there's a model here based on what we're seeing in some of these other states especially as it seems to me is going to happen, California is going to remain an economic uh, uh, basket case. And now that we have one party rule, at some point I think the people are going to ask why, and that may give the Republicans some chance at uh, coming back. So. <laughs> uh, before we uh, proceed, I just wanted to, um, point out that um, Ethan Rarick wants to make an announcement uh, at the end of this session. Pardon me? Oh, no, 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 I don't want you to do it now, but I want people to stay put so that um, Ethan can make his announcement. He has to come all the way from back there to come up here, and I don't want half the, half the place disappearing in the meantime. So in any case, uh, let me ask a question before we open up, just, just two, basically, and then we can open it up. And the first is, <clears throat> Insofar as the GOP can shift the discussion to uh, fiscal issues, public employee unions, excessive uh, waste, uh, these Cadillac pension plans, and so on, uh, how do you uh, uh, avoid the dynamic of the primary campaign um, and the inevitable effort to outflank one or the other candidate uh, in the GOP on the immigration issue. And um, I'm sure Meg Whitman didn't want the immigration issue uh, to play out the way it did, but it was almost inevitable that a losing, someone who's losing, say, in the Republican primary is going to push for that uh, if they think it's going to win, uh, be a winner for them. So um, how does that play out uh, what is the room to get away from uh, that particular issue? And how will the top two vote getter um, affect this in the future? Anyone here? Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think that's a good question. I think, you know, th there are two things, right? There's, there's a political strategy that can, that can avoid that, right? You can say, you know, if we're up 50%, you know, we don't, we don't need to run to, the, run, run to the right in the primary. Or even when we lose our lead, but none of that lead went to Steve Poisoner. All that lead just went to undecided. You know, y y as a campaign, the Meg Whitman campaign had a lot of discipline on, on other things, but they didn't seem to have discipline on, on that primary strategy. The second thing is we're going to have very new rules of the game with this top two primary. Now, if we look at what happened in, in 1998 and 2000 in those primaries, we don't see a whole lot of hope that moderate candidates will do extremely well. We see a lot of the, uh, the, these new primary people who are, who are walking into a primary who are, who are barred before, the, the, you know, the, the decline to state voters. In, in 1998, a lot of them went for, instead of crossing over to vote for a moderate in the Republican primary, 
more Republican, instead of more Democrats crossing over to vote in a contested Republican Senate primary, more Republicans crossed the aisle to vote for Barbara Boxer, according to exit polls in that primary than before. So it's not clear that it'll completely help moderates, but there's this chance that you can run to the middle in a primary, pick up votes from the other party and from, the, and from those declined to state voters and survive being pulled to the right in a primary or the left if you're a Dem. Let me uh, talk a little bit about that because I did a study of the 1998 and 2000 open primary and there uh, uh, four uh, Latino Republicans actually won the uh, nominate, nomination and were elected. And there were some fairly moderate Democrats that won. Uh, now, you're, uh, Todd's right that it's not going to be an, an immediate huge change, but it was something of a change on the margins. But let's not forget what this thing, this new Prop 14 really does. We're not going to have party nominees at all. You think that through. We've already seen that in the special elections now. It's the ballot is going to say uh, Joe Smith prefers Republicans. Tom Jones prefers Democrat. And then um, uh, uh, Mary White uh, uh, prefers no party. You'll, every voter will get that same ballot. If Steve Cooley had been able to run in that kind of a system and could have run with no party, I, and I believe he could have made the top two, you only got just have to make the top two, he would have won in the fall. It was the Republican label that brought him down. So I do think there's an un, unknown change that could occur here as we go into the no nominee, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, t t top two uh, runoff. It would, it would help not to have a primary. I think we learned yesterday. Yeah. No. <laughs> right. And on, on the immigration issue, I, I think uh, California Republicans, at least many of them, understand that um, immigrant bashing is not electorally um, you know, productive, especially in, the, in general elections. Uh, but there's a problem for Republicans is in the National Republican Party, um, including our congressional Republicans, will continue to introduce things like birthright citizenship and so forth. And, and so California Republicans are kind of caught between the National Party and the electoral requirements of winning in California. So. I, it, that's just a dilemma that I'm not exactly sure how that's going to be resolved, but um, I think clearly the, to win in California statewide, you have to be immigrant friendly. Let's open it up to the audience, please. Uh, over the next four years, we are all going to be the There is a mic. <laughs> Over the next four years, we're going to be treated to a series of homilies and little lectures from the most prominent Democrat in this state about frugality, uh, maybe sleeping on a mattress on the floor, driving a blue Plymouth, and so on and so forth. As a tactical matter, Tony Quinn, how can the Republicans outflank that constant barrage of frugality from Jerry Brown? <laughs> well, we did see that once before. <clears throat> Uh, the Blue Plymouth actually came from the 1975, and he was very popular. Uh, so popular, in fact, that there was this, grouse, this uh, groundswell of people that wanted him to run for president. And that was one of the three times that Jerry Brown ran. I'm still not entirely convinced that he might not hear that groundswell again this year. But uh, that uh, kind of ran its course. And uh, by the time Howard Jarvis came along in 1978, uh, uh, Jerry Brown was kind of on the wrong side of a lot of that. I mean, I think he faces a really hard, hard slog in trying to get the voters to, to vote to maintain a tax increase that they've already uh, voted down. And, uh, you know, saying you're going to somehow uh, get rid of everybody's cell phones, I'm not sure that translates into people wanting to vote for that tax uh, uh, measure. That will be on the ballot, I'm sure, in uh, June. Yes, sir, there was a question right here. Uh, so getting back a little bit to the future about in the Prop 14 world, um, I've actually heard a lot of 
conversation about that in the Republican Party about, you know, what if we try to run people um, without being Republicans, run Republicans, but not with a label. Um, I guess my question in that scenario is would enough actual Republican voters recognize that that's what's going on, or would there be a potential for some other more conservative candidate to come along in the primary and actually run with that Republican label, and essentially they're not being enough independent voters to get that moderate Republican who doesn't have the label into the top two primary. So is, is there a danger on that front? Uh, I think there might be a difference between district elections and statewide. I think in district elections, somebody who um, claims to be the real Republican will win over somebody who's running away from the party label in, in, to get into, um, into the final. In the, in the statewide, I think it's a more interesting question. And I think that somebody who presents as an independent uh, might have a real chance. A, a Cooley, for example, if, if he presented himself as an independent, would have um, had a good chance to, to advance to the final um, on, that, on that basis. I mean, Can I? I go ahead. Well, I think obviously you can get that message out because campaigns in California, what, the thing that's easiest for us to see are the TV ads, but campaigns in California, especially at the district level, are just run by micro-targeted mail. I mean, you know, Steve Glazer can tell you, what did the, the Brown campaign got out? Something like 12 million pieces in the last week. So you can get out the message that someone's a Republican to Republican loyal voters through the mail. You don't have to put it on the ballot. The second thing that I think is going to happen, you know, we, we heard a lot of talk about whether there's any field clearing in, in, the, in the primary. Well, you didn't need to do a ton of explicit field clearing in this primary, but in a top two primary, both parties have a huge incentive to clear the field to make sure that their, that their candidates don't split the vote. If you have three Democrats running in Berkeley, none of them might make the top, you know, the top two for, for an assembly race. You need to clear the field. And, and so there's going to be a lot more, I think, backroom politics and you know, the, 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 sort of the, the institutional money resources clearing fields in, in the top two world than we've seen before. Uh, the woman in the, in the back. Oops. Following up on um, a couple of things that were mentioned, Jarvis was talked about a couple of times in, and in the bio of Kim Nalder, Prop 13. And so I'm wondering how the structural um, issues with Prop 13 might play out in the campaigns coming up, you know, related to Brown's relationship to that. And I know Prop 13 was a big thing in Whitman's uh, 2010 gubernatorial campaign? I think uh, Prop 13 is radioactive if you, you know, when we do polling questions about it, if you phrase it with the term Prop 13 in it, um, people want to keep Prop 13. So, you know, going forward, you can imagine Brown wanting to do something like a split roll on Prop 13 and disaggregating the property taxes for um, individuals and for uh, business. And that, that might get popular support, but not if the term Prop 13 is used. The idea of, of changing tax rates on property for businesses may gain some popularity, but the battle will be between how that's framed, right? And, and the, you know, the term Prop 13, you know, without any other thinking, um, is difficult. And the same thing with the uh, restructuring of the local versus the state uh, that Brown's also trying to undertake. He's, he's trying to do it without framing it as a Prop 13 change, but in, in many ways it is. Can I just mention one thing on that? Uh, we did have sort of that uh, campaign this year. I think it was called Prop 24, which was to roll back the corporate tax breaks that were in the 2009 budget deal. The only, only thing that's left of the 2009 budget deal is Maldonado sold his vote for the open uh, primary, which is gonna have a monstrous impact. And then the Democrats somehow went along with, with the desire of business to put all these corporate tax breaks. Uh, and yet, even with that, and even with the huge Democratic landslide year, the public said, yeah, we're gonna keep those uh, uh, corporate breaks. I do think that the, the recent history suggests uh, that the voters will not vote to uh, tax uh, uh, business more. I think they know how bad the economy is, uh, and you can take a look at just the last few years. I mean, they did not vote, they voted against taxing tobacco companies. 
They voted against taxing oil companies. They voted against taxing rich people. I always ask the question, when we look at the, what I like to call the working families tax increase, because that was really what the 2009 tax increase is, sales tax, income tax, and car tax. And I say if they won't vote to tax all these great Satans, why do you think they're going to vote to tax them themselves? And I do think that's one of the big issues we're going to see uh, when we have this, this coming special. Yes, sir. I um I had a couple comments first. I'm just because and when I before I come to my question, one about the uh, blanket primary. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't know if the legislation allows you to run in the primary with your party label and then switch in the general to no affiliation. For example, ballot designations can be changed from primary to general under law. That would change the whole dynamic. The smart strategy is to run as a Republican in the primary and then go to no label in the general. Uh, and hope that the Republican Party gets out the message to Republicans, that's our guy, or that's our gal. Uh, secondly, uh, one other comment you made about the dominated district in Berkeley with three Democrats, they're not going to clear the field in dominated districts. There's no reason to because the only, re uh, first of all, no Democrat would say in that district I should get out when the Democrat nominee is going to win the Berkeley district. It'll be in districts that are competitive where they would want to do that so they ensure their candidate makes the runoff, I think. Anyhow, my, my question has to do with Prop 13, again, because I think that's a very important overarching issue in our state that people don't realize the consequences of it. And do you see the Republican Party being able to come back as a party of, the, of Prop 13, that we, we, you know, we're, we're preserving it, we're not going to do anything about it, uh, we're going to keep it as is, uh, et cetera. Is that a way to uh, help them make a comeback in California? And uh, of course, I also agree with you on these immigrant bashing. I think as long as that happens, it's very difficult. Well, it seems to me that um, the Republican Party, if it has any brand besides immigrant bashing in California, is it is a, it's a no-tax party. Um, that's been consistent in the legislative Republicans. I mean, there's, there's been some slippage at the margins, but I think the public recognizes that the Republican Party is, is, is an anti-tax party. Um, and so, I mean, I think maybe emphasizing uh, Prop 13 and the threats to it could be, uh, you know, something of an advantage. But uh, you know, I think people probably um, are not voting ex exclusively on the tax issue. They're voting on a range of different issues. And Californians have some advantage polling shows on taxes, but um, there's disadvantages in, in other areas as well. Can I just, just uh, comment on one thing? There's no, no label in the general election. I had not heard that uh, uh, be, before. Um, I don't know whether that, is, that, whether that is possible. In the state of Washington, which is the model for California, it's not, as far as I know. But uh, Republicans for a very long time in this state did very well by hiding their party. And that's what cross-filing was all about, if you know the history of that. Uh, people, were, people, the, people who were Republicans managed to run as Dem Democrats. Uh, as far as the Prop 13, hey, that brought them back in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. I mean, the impact of Prop 13, first of all, in the 1978 election, in which the Republicans at that time only had 23 seats in the Assembly and went, went up to 30 seats, and then the election of Ronald Reagan as president with a very dramatic tax uh, uh, a change which he did uh, effect in 1981 uh, and then the Republicans governors uh, for, for 16 years uh, the state would have been much much different had there been no Proposition thir 13. But I think, I think the Republican Party can only win as the party defending Prop 13 if the Democrats are stupid enough to be the party attacking Prop 13. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I think that there's, uh, I mean, to, to join in the conversation, I, I think this, it's true that um, fiscal issues provide an opportunity for the GOP, but um, it has to be managed carefully. It's not, uh, it's not as easy as uh, one might think offhand. For example, there, are, there is discontent with Proposition 13 uh, on issues that have to do with, uh, for example, huge disparity between young homeowners uh, the share of the property tax that they pay. It's not just commercial versus residential. Um, moreover, uh, 
the idea of, you know, have, it, it appears that the Republican Party is struggling with whether or not the, the, the people are going to have a chance to vote on taxes. Um, and, uh, you know, if that's managed in a way in, uh, in which the Republican Party is seen as not only the anti-tax party, but the party that uh, won't let the people have a choice about how they want to manage their fiscal affairs by not even permitting a vote or, or being opposed to a vote, uh, I think there is the potential uh, for some mismanagement of that issue, although I do think it is perhaps the best uh, way to go. I should say, too, that the, I'd like to see what the ultimate response among public employee unions is on uh, being in the, I guess, you know, being careful with this analogy, being in the crosshairs um, at the moment. Uh, but in any case, um, the, when the nurses, the teachers, and the firefighters, uh, and the policemen on the beat begin to generate advertisement about cheap shots at public employees, I'm not sure that the issue will play out quite as well as, as, as we might think. If it's not carefully crafted, if, it, uh, if, you're over, if one begins to overreach on the public employee, public pension issue, uh, it, 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 uh, it, could, it could backfire. I, th I think that I, I, I've written this, that the Republican strategy of opposing their votes, putting the tax measure on the ballot is a good idea. This tax measure can be put on the ballot through a majority vote as an amendment to a existing initiative. That's how Prop 15 last year got on the ballot. I think there's a possibility that they could even do it through the Budget Act. I don't know what court would tell them that they couldn't. I think the Republicans are better off if, it is, if this is a partisan election over this tax thing. The Democrats want to, to maintain the taxes, the Republicans don't. I think one of the problems was so much stuff got, got mushy during the, the uh, election uh, uh, campaign. I mean, much of the campaign dealt with Gary Brown's age and, and Meg, Meg Whitman's uh, how, uh, house, housekeeper. I think that if we had an election where we really dealt with, do we want to get out of this recession through growth, which is the Texas model, uh, or do we want to get out of this, uh, this budget mess through higher taxes, that that kind of a debate, the Republicans would probably, that would be the first step toward coming, uh, toward, uh, uh, coming, coming back. And I, I think Prop 13 remains a winner for the Republican Party as long as the electorate continues to skew older, which it does, um, because there are those inequities by age. Younger voters might be less enchanted with Prop 13 when their next door neighbors who've been there since 1978 are paying, you know, three times less than they are. And there are other other issues with Prop 13 with inequities with business too. You know, there could be inroads there potentially because you could have businesses side by side, one of which bought the property earlier and one that bought it later and they're paying different rates. Or retirees who would like to downsize their homes but they don't want to pay the increased property taxes for a smaller place and so they're trapped in their bigger home. Um, but all of those sort of details require information, and, and voters have a, a shockingly low level of knowledge and information, and, and as long as the message is packaged as Prop 13, which has just become this sort of untouchable uh, measure, it, it's a winner. Yes, sir. Tony, I'm curious, I'm curious about your prescription uh, attack the public employees and bloated government for the Republican Party. Uh, as a, you said, this was the model for a comeback to, uh, to basically to go after public employees and bloated government. Uh, that's exactly what Meg Whitman did. She but she also it. She didn't do but it she very well, though, did she? Well, that's a different I mean, look argument. Look at how Chris Christie's gone about it. He's gone about it discussing the schools in, in terms of quality. Uh, and, um, um, you know, th there are a lot of, uh, of issues there. I don't know why the school board's association is not only paying its executive director $500,000, but every single lobbyist is paid about 200000 I mean, those are issues that I think they, that, you, that you can uh, uh, raise. Uh, and and it, it seems to me that there is a, a division in the state that's in such bad shape as we are between the working people who, who, who feel like they're paying already 
uh, uh, taxes that are too high. And I mean, our tax, our income tax is second highest in the nation. Our sales tax now is, is, the, is the highest. Uh, between that and public employees that they see getting too many of these hundred thousand dollar plus uh, uh, pen, uh, pensions. So where, uh, I mean, where, where, where would immigration? This stuff in the in the uh, papers. Where would immigration and the environment fit into your into Pardon? your form? Where would immigration and the environment fit into your formula? Because uh, truly, Whitman did spend a hundred and maybe eighty yeah. million dollars going after public employees and bloated government. Uh, I think that the uh, Im immigration uh, issue, and I'm not at all sure that the Republicans can help themselves. The problem with the Republican Party is it's getting older. It's older white voters. They resent change. They're moving up to Redding and Lincoln and all these places to get away from the urban change. And, uh, you know, you go talk to them about birthright citizenship. Oh, yeah, we should repeal the 14th Amendment and somehow all the Mexicans will, will go back. I mean, that's a real problem. Uh, for uh, for them, um, and, and, and as far as the invi uh, in, uh, environmental issue goes, I think that has to be seen in terms of the economic uh, uh, issue, and especially as if if and when we come out of this recession, if California does not come out, as I think will be the case, as well as the other states, especially the other big mega state, which is uh, which is uh, uh, Texas. The Republicans are going to ask, why are they doing better? Why are they creating jobs? Why are they putting people to work? And by the way, speaking of Texas, you don't find immigrant bashing there because the Latinos are part of the political uh, estab establishment. Uh, they become part of the political establishment here on the other side. So I do think that there are some ways Republicans can handle this, but it's not going to be easy because of their pro, uh, proclivity to get into, get into so many of these, uh, the, these issues that kill, that kill them with the newer voters. One, one other note on the, uh, the pension issue. It seems to me that Meg Whitman kind of compromised her stance on this by basically exempting public safety uh, public employees. And so that was the origin of the, the famous remark about Meg, Meg Whitman. And, and so I, I think you know, if, if she were getting any traction with the electorate on this issue, she certainly didn't help herself by um, compromising in that way. Just a moment in the white shirt. Um, with Proposition 14, we're going to end up, it was suggested by Todd that we were end up with more extreme candidates on both sides of the aisle. And assuming that Democrats don't figure out the fiscal issues of California, and assuming that the national GOP continues to drive the immigration conversation further to the right, then it seems like independent voters would be completely alienated. And I'm just wondering if there are any... Um, any previous elections or perhaps predictions on where these voters might turn to, assuming all that happens? Well, you know, so, so obviously I wasn't saying that, that it's going to lead to more extremism. It just it means that parties will have a bigger role and parties might strategically want to pick more moderates. Um, but, but, it, that, but you raise a great question about, you know, where are independent voters in California? Well, if you look at all the polls about what people think about government, what people think about, you know, their trust in government, faith in government, the direction of the state, the the conventional wisdom is California's moved too far to the extremes and the, 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 the middle feels alienated. No. The middle is the happiest part of California politics right now on all of those issues. Independent voters are the people who, who feel that way. You know, a part of this is I think we have mostly moderate policies coming out of Sacramento that we haven't had either of the extremes win. Maybe it's a little bit of the converse of if you're not paying attention, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. Maybe they're just not paying attention and not outraged. But, but right now the middle is relatively happy with California politics, which I think means that we're not likely to see a huge Ross Perot effect in this next election. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. You know, I'd like to suggest another tack for the conversation. Uh, in my view, California has a non-functional governmental structure and a non-functional tax structure. Uh, too many people don't remember that before Prop 13, AB 80 was passed, which curbed what Jesse Enra called uh, the power of the assessors that even a Barbary pilot, pirate would, have, would envy. 
And the corruption in the Los Angeles and San Francisco assessor's office, where the assessors, uh, especially San Francisco, went to prison for what he was doing. And, but the, the, the thing that happened was, because people felt that they were going to lose their homes because of the conduct of the assessors when supervisors wanted to vote all sorts of things but not raise taxes, told the assessor, get out there and get more money. So people voted for 13 because they felt that it was the alternative was to lose their homes. Now, we've got another thing that comes into that equation. That's the housing meltdown. And the housing that's melting down is at the very high end of this tax structure. And the people can't pay those taxes right now. And that's why a lot of them are in foreclosure, among other things, as well as long as the mortgage. So what California, what I would suggest is that you people look at is, what are we gonna do about creating a governmental structure? For instance, in the urban areas, in San Francisco, for example, and other towns, the, the primary player and the controlling campaign contributors are now the public employee unions. They own the school districts, school boards. They own the Board of Supervisors in most counties. So the question is, how can this be reconciled with solving the problem of governing California and bringing California to a point where it goes upward instead of downward? You know, the people actually have taken some steps in that direction, and if there's a uh, legacy for Arnold, it's going to be having pushed through the redistricting reform uh, uh, structure. We do have 14 people that are going to sit down and they're doing it right now, trying to figure out how to do uh, districts. That certainly is better than 14 people like me doing it when I work for the uh, legis uh, legislature. Also, I do think there is a major change with the, uh, uh, with, with the, the top, top two law. And I think there are other reforms out there. Uh, the legislature should be very careful, and I think maybe they're beginning to be a little careful because some fine day somebody could put a ballot measure on the ballot to re go back to a part-time legislature, you know, cut their pay and send them home. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure right now that the public wouldn't be willing to vote for that. So there is some churning in the process trying to clean up what people are beginning to see as some real problems. I mean, we amended the Constitution five times last year, and we're going to have three constitutional amendments if there's a June ballot on that ballot, probably. So, you know, we are changing the rules. What? Gentleman in the brown sweater, tan sweater. Uh, this is a question for Tony Quinn and anyone else who wants to chime in. Um, one thing that I have a question about when you're saying that Republicans should move forward by uh, attacking the public employees union sort of a common scapegoat out there is the prison guards um, and the overpopulation of the prisons. Um, if the Republicans sort of take this tact and go after that, how do they reconcile that with their traditional sort of tough on crime reputation? And you know, clearly you'd have to reduce the prison population and all these things would sort of be uh, contradictory to Republicans' tough and crime message in the past. Well, I, I'm talking about what I think they should do, not what they do. And I agree that, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're as much uh, to blame as the Democrats are for what a lot of people feel is a, is a very uh, bloated uh, uh, prison guards union. I mean, that, that, that's strongly felt there, and neither party is willing to take them on at all. Uh, Governor-elect Brown f flew down to uh, Las, Las Vegas to be at their uh, conference last, last year after they had, of course, spent a fair amount of money getting him e uh, uh, elected. A lot of this problem goes back to the Gray Davis era, especially the, the pensions. I think you roll in what is a feeling, I think a growing feeling in the, in, the, in the state that the public employee unions are not suffering while the ordinary working person is. You roll that in with some kind of pension re reform. Uh, and and uh, again, uh, Meg Whitman didn't have any message on that and Arnold Schwarzenegger got scared off by it. But I do think that there is a sense out there, I mean the people look at 
80, we, we still have $80 billion left after we've done all these, all these budget cuts. Well, where's all that money uh, uh, go, uh, going? Uh, I do think that the Republicans have been very uh, uh, bad as, at, at, at actually laying out what the, you know, what the fiscal uh, uh, situ situation is. And I'm very critical of them for simply, you know, saying, well, we're just not going to vote for any taxes and not talking about anything, anything else. They're in this fix that they're in uh, to a large degree, f you know, it's, 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 their own, it's their own fault. And the whole prison guards and the prison uh, pop population is just a part of that. I think we have time for, do we have time for one more question? Two more? Two more? Okay. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Bob Mahalo, a few clarification points. I was glad to see Tony said he was a public employee. <laughs> Two is the, uh, the financial meltdowns of a Bush recession. It has nothing to do with the uh, public employees. But I wanted to clarify on the blanket, top two, and the uh, open, because you used that mistakenly, Tony. Blanket primary was passed in 96, was in law in 98 and 2000. Blanket primary, every primary voter got the same ballot with the party candidates' names on it. Open primary is different. Open primary is what we have for presidential races, which is that if I'm an independent and I go to the Democratic president, or go to the presidential primary, I have the option of, op of asking for a Democratic ballot or a Republican ballot. Now this top two crap is a modified blanket primary where every voter gets the same ballot, but as Tony and others have talked about is, if I'm a scam artist, I can run like Cooley, and I don't have to put in my party. So if you go into a supermarket and trying to buy a canned product, how many cans would you buy with no label on it? But for some reason, the voters now have allowed this system to be the new system. But it may get changed, because when it was on the ballot before, Prop 63 and Prop 60, they voted for the one that said they guaranteed 68% and the Top two only got 52, 53. So we want to get one more question. One final point is about taxes. <laughs> Can I respond? Tony again, Tony again, to talk about taxes. You forgot Prop 63, Daryl Steinberg, tax the millionaires. It did pass. Those income over a million, the money went to mental health care. That did pass by the voters. All I have to say to Bob's comment on the open primary is we did have that, okay, the blanket primary, you're, you're correct. We had that system and we kept the party nominees. Your party, in conjunction with the Republican Party, and I've always felt the public's uh, at greatest risk when the two parties agree on anything that deals with <laughs> elections. Uh, your party went into court and got your good friend Justice Scalia to throw that system out. And, and that's why you have the top two now. What you've got is worse than you had before. You should have stopped your party from going to your pal Justice Scalia and getting this thing, that first one, thrown out. We have no idea that Judge Scalia, who ruled 7 and 2, would then turn around and say the top two was okay. No, he did it. He was he one of the dissenters on that one. <laughs> one more, one more. Oh. One second, we'll get the mic here for you. God, you're hard to follow. Um, when is the Republican Party going to wake up and smell the coffee and quit trying to equate running a business with running government? The people of the state of California are hungry for services. They want the potholes filled. Business doesn't provide services. Um, That's somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, my understanding is a lot of that is contracted out to private companies. Well, what can I tell you? Okay. Right they, they will, once we have someone who's made a billion dollars working for government who can spend that money on their own election. Right. Right? That's what they're probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I just a quick... Um, uh, By the way, thank you very much. A quick logistical announcement. I also failed to mention this morning the sponsors, and I want to thank them one more time. Darius Anderson and Platinum Advisors, Chevron Corporation, the California Association of Realtors, Farmers Insurance, 
Susie and Steve Swat, Colleen McAndrews, and the two political law firms who are sponsoring, co-sponsoring the lunch, so you can thank them for the free uh, sandwich you're about to get, Remcho, Johansson and Purcell, and Nielsen, Merksimer, Perinello, Gross, and Leone.